Rick, you spent five years of your life, you know, filming Joe Exotic, gathering this footage for a reality show, but the reality show is not Tiger King. Your footage famously burned down in the studio fire on, on the zoo grounds. What is your gut instinct as to who burned that building? Because it was somebody. You know, Joe Exotic went off. He blamed me. He blamed Carol Baskin. He blamed a, a DJ in Tampa. He blamed anybody and everybody but himself. But the bottom line is, two days before the studio fire, he and I got into an argument over the fact that I had a contract with him to make the reality show. And he was so upset, he made an immediate departure, said, I'm gone from the park for a couple of days. He changed the locks on the studio so I couldn't get in. And the next thing you know, the studio burned. So the FBI has a pretty good idea who did it. So his alibi was that he was out of town at some funeral? Yeah, that's his alibi. Do we have anybody else at the funeral who confirms that he was there during the time of the burning of the fire? You know, I can only tell you he was not at the park for the two days prior to the fire. He did arrive back at the park, though, early that day, right after the fire was discovered. But uh, who knows at this point? Uh, we know it was arson. Uh, obviously, I wouldn't have burned down my own show because I lost all of the footage. Uh, and I had invested everything I had. This was going to be my retirement job, was that reality show. Rick, how would Tiger King have been different if it was your footage that we saw and not what was gathered by the Netflix crew? Uh, it would have been more violent uh, and probably exposed a lot more things than, than what you saw in the documentary series of Tiger King. Uh, we had footage, and Joe knew it. That was what the argument a few nights before the fire was over was. I finally told him, look, I own you right now. And, and he, he got upset, and I said, look, if I were to let the video go out that, that I have shot, of you killing animals on this park, of you tricking people by taking in their animals, you probably go to jail. And he just went berserk and then boom, he was off the park, locks were changed, we had a fire. So maybe you shouldn't have told him that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in hindsight, but you know, Joe, nobody told Joe what to do. Uh, Joe lived in his own little world on that 12 acre little park he was God. They're, they're, the police couldn't come in and do anything. Nobody could touch him. So he could run around and shoot at you with his gun. He shot at me three times just to scare me, and I laughed. About at you or, like, over your head? Or? He just shot, you know, at my feet uh, with his gun. He shot in the studio. When we'd be in the studio doing an Internet show for him at the, at, as night in the Internet show, he'd shoot right through the building, you know, and it'd echo through this tin building and scare the hell out of you. Uh, there, and Joe had no no rules, no laws on that 12 acres. He he was king because he had all these exotic animals, and the only people that could touch him were the feds. And the feds only came in once every three months to inspect the park, and he hid all the illegal workers and basically did his thing and got away for, well, nearly 17 years. You have footage of him stone-cold killing tigers, just shooting them right there in the head if he wants to. I witnessed it myself. Let, let me tell you a, a story. Uh, one day this lady came into to the park with a horse trainer and she she came up She got out hugged Joe said listen. I can't afford to take care of my horse anymore Can you give him a home? Can you let him you've got a big pasture and Joe cried with her and hugged with her sure I'll take care of your horse and uh, he said let's unhitch the trainer. We'll get the trainer back tomorrow No sooner did that lady get off the park than Joe said Rick bring your camera roll on this He walked right up to the horse trainer drew the revolver out, shot the horse dead in the trailer, then cut it up and fed it to the tigers. That's the kind of guy he was. Wow. You know, I think about him and he's, I don't know, how would you describe him? Megalomaniac, egomaniac, narcissist, I mean, all of them? You know, yeah, all of them and more. Uh, Joe used to cry on my shoulder, literally, when no one was around. He didn't know if he was gay or not. He wasn't sure. Uh, yet he was living this broad, flamboyant, gay lifestyle as the gay redneck cowboy, he called himself. But he really didn't know. And uh, he was a lost soul, so to speak. Uh, you know, living with Travis, Travis wasn't gay, for one thing. Travis would never have sex with him. And he would cry about, oh, Travis won't let me make love to him. He won't make love to me. And I kept trying to tell him, it's because he's a 20-year-old kid and he's not gay. He's just a drug addict. 
Uh, but but Joe Joe was. What about uh, John Finley? John Finley was he gay? Yeah, John was yeah John was gay up until he met a girl who worked at the park, and then he decided no, I'm not gay anymore. So John was very impressionable. Seems naive, almost a little underdeveloped. You know what? So Billy, anybody who worked in that park, anyone who worked in that zoo for any amount of time, including myself, you got caught up in the the, the incredible unreal scenario of living with with 1200 animals uh going into cages with tigers i was in the the, the cage at one time and attacked by juvenile tigers uh, they, they tore into my jugular vein and i bled um but there's something very powerful about being able to handle big cats and so you were lured in to this surreal world of joe exotic and he acted on camera like he you know he ran the whole world he wasn't scared of anything he was very scared of the tigers, very afraid. The ones he'd get in the cages with were either blind or they were sedated. Uh, it was all just a facade. It was a big facade. You, you, I, in reading about you, I know you, you've, you've struggled with, uh, with substance abuse. You've had that victory. Was the camera Joe's drug? Yeah, it was. Uh, he, we, we had three camera people that would follow him around from the time he got up to the time he went to bed. And this guy would go day and night, I mean, on two or three hours sleep. But he was also doing the meth to keep him going at the time. So Joe was a drug addict, too. He did meth, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Joe. Oh, yeah. He and he applied the young boys there to keep them around. That's exactly how he kept Travis and then later the other young man around. They were drug addicts. And Joe would buy them guns and get them a four-wheeler. And they didn't have to do any work. All they had to do was stand around and let Joe kiss on them for the cameras. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, Joe is a surreal, one-of-a-kind figure. A very, very evil guy at heart, but also very lost. And I think that's why you almost feel sorry for him in the documentary series at some point. But believe me, there's nothing to feel sorry about. He was a very evil guy to the animals and to the people that worked for him. You gave him the ultimate, the ultimate nirvana high, the ultimate euphoria. You built Tiger King by putting him in the throne. It was your idea to wrap him, right, in, in robes and have him sit on the throne. I literally had my crew build a, a king's throne with a crushed velvet and everything and put him in it, and I had tigers brought in around him, and we flew a drone in for the shot for the opening of, of what would have been my show. But what people don't know is that, and I have the footage, behind that chair was the actual trainer. Those weren't his tigers. Those were someone else's tigers that they could control, and he was behind there with a gun and had the tigers chained because Joe was terrified to get in cages with tigers. He, he wouldn't even use his own. So it's all an act, but he, but there's one in one episode he was being dragged around by his foot by a tiger. Yeah, no. yeah, that actually happened prior to my getting to the park. And uh, if you notice, nobody went in to help him. Yeah, uh, he was on his own. A, what are you going to do? You know, you can only shoot the tiger. And B, half the people are probably standing back, going, "I hope the tiger wins." Joe was not a very nice guy. Is he capable of murder? It you know, he's in there 22 years because of murder for hire, paying a guy 3,000 bucks to go kill his arch nemesis, Carol Baskin. Do you, I mean, always spoke about it, but, you know, you assume most of it was hot air. Do you think Joe actually gave the 3,000 and fully intended for her to be killed? Billy, I could tell you that Joe approached me on numerous occasions telling me he'd make a rich man out of me if I'd go down to Tampa and take care of Carol. Uh, he would ask anyone around that he could, and I laughed it off. I, I, I thought, ah, oh, the guy, he just hates her, and he'd get on the air and talk bad about her. Do I think he's capable? 110%. Joe hated Carol Baskin. He owed her a million dollars from a lawsuit that he had lost with her, and she was making his life miserable. Absolutely. And I do believe he was capable. I believe every bit of it what convicted him. Well, he went on and on about how Carol Baskin, her ultimate sin is that she killed her first husband, Don, and fed him to the tigers. Now, I don't know if you have any inclination on that, but do you think Carol Baskin, now that law enforcement is looking at her a little closely again, is she uh, super innocent or is she in trouble? You know, uh, 
Billy, Joe and Carol are two peas in a pod. They both have got that power ego thing going for them. They both have these different personas that are very strange and flamboyant, and they both know the power of owning big cats. Uh, they're not that much different from each other. Do I believe that Carol killed her husband? I believe that the husband mysteriously disappeared and he had no reason to. So I do believe foul play. Can I speculate and say it was Carol? I don't think I can do that. Rick, after the studio fire that took all of your footage, you, you, you left and went back to Dallas, Texas, where you're from, and your home burned down? Yeah, actually, the, the full story is the day the studio burned, I dropped to my knees and I cried. I mean, there went my retirement. I knew it was gone. There was no getting it back. And I had put in a year living in this dirty, filthy zoo and putting up with Joe Exotic. And it was all gone in one fire. I went back to Dallas, and I'll be quite honest with you. I went to seek some help. I went to get some mental therapy. I saw a psychiatrist for nearly six months. And six months to the day, at the exact same hour of the zoo fire, my house burned down on top of me and nearly killed me. Do you expect foul play on the house? The FBI did. Uh, we know it, was, it, it wasn't an accident, but I think it was the roommate who lived there just coming home drunk. Uh, we never got a story out of him, and I sued him, and we never could get him to testify. But the, the bottom line is the FBI did have suspicions that Joe could have been behind it because... Two other of Joe's enemies had their homes burned down in that same six-month period. So there, there was a whole lot of circumstantial belief that possibly he could have been behind it. Whew. Did you get paid at all from the Netflix documentary? Did they include you as a producer? No, no. Out of time? I, I was strictly an interviewee. What they did, though, they paid for my footage that they got. As you see, the Joe Tiger King, him and the throne, I own all that footage. They did license that fo footage for a few thousand dollars. But no, I did not get paid for the interview. So you are now freelance reporting in Buda, Norway. I, I am at Buda New, which is our local online newspaper. I get to report in English. Uh, and I have quite a following here because I'm about the only American in Buda, Norway. And, uh, of course, we live in the Arctic Circle. We have the northern lights here at night. So there's always something fun to report about. So I'm still kind of doing the same thing here I did back at Inside Edition, some of the daredevil reports, jumping in the ice-cold water and, and being pulled out and being pulled up by helicopters with the, uh, the uh, sea rescue people. I'm having a wonderful time in Norway. Life is good for me, unfortunately. It's not good for Joe. It's hard to let things go, though. I, I mean, I've been through stuff in my life where you, 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 resentment is like drinking poison and hoping it kills your enemies. And that's, uh, that's from Nelson Mandela. But yeah. how did you let it go? How do you let this incredible you know, resentment that must have been there go? You know what, Billy? Um, more than a resentment, uh, the way I'm letting it go is I'm forgiving myself. Um, I was there at the park, and it took three or four months before I started seeing and understanding what he was doing was abuse, not only on the animals, but on the people that worked for him. And I continued to shoot this reality show. You got sucked in to something that I, was wrong. I, I sold out my journalistic integrity, and, and I will never forgive myself for it. But, but being able to do a show like this with you and be able to admit my wrong and my mistake, that, that's, that's payment back enough for me. I, I apologize for what I did. Well, that's, that's all you can do. And then we, uh, you know, we, we were living in a society a few years ago. I think it's changing, frankly. Living in a society where, you know, you're one and done and public shaming and you're out of here. But that's, that's coming around. We're all realizing that we are uh, very flawed people. And all it takes is ownership. I'm sorry. My bad ask for forgiveness, and you move on with your life without regrets. And I hope that and you're that's doing that. exactly what I'm doing, Billy. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm moving on with my life. I have a beautiful Norwegian wife. I have a wonderful job working at Buda New, the local newspaper here. And I live in probably the greatest country I've ever been to. And I've traveled the world quite a bit. I've got to tell you, I, uh, when I was studying abroad as a junior, I met a Norwegian au pair, and her name was Mona. And uh, I wonder where Mona is today. I always wonder. We had a wonderful uh, European romance.
Excellent. I'll tell you what, there's something about Scandinavian women. You just can't beat it. Don't tell me your wife's name is Mona. <laughs> no. Kristen. Kristen Kirkham now. Yeah. Kristen Kirkham, what a great name. Well, yeah. uh, you know, has has Tiger King reached Norway? Can they use Norwegian what? Netflix for this? Oh, my God. Are you kidding? It's number one here in Norway. I'm on the front page of the newspaper here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've got people all over. the. I can't even go down to the gas station now so and, buy a, and buy a coffee or a pack of cigarettes. And they go, hey, and they're screaming in Norse and pointing at me, you know, so... But, but I'm kind of known in this town anyway. And, and like I say, it's 55,000 people, so it's a small community. You're known in the town, and then this comes, and they're like, oh, my God, he must be some kind of God or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. My newspaper, Buddha knew that I work for as a reporter, is now doing stories on me. Uh, because, look, our reporter is now this internationally famous guy because of Tiger King. Uh, you know, but as you well know, fame comes and goes, and this will die down sooner or later. And I'll get some sleep finally. <laughs> well, it's just a riveting tale. I uh, I really appreciate you sparing a little time for us, Rick. Thank you so uh -huh. much. Hey, I love the show. I've loved it for years, and I've been following you for a long time. And uh, you you've come a long way. You're doing great. Thank you very much. It means a lot. Take care. All right. See ya. <laughs> That's goodbye in Norwegian, by the way. <laughs> Hada. What is it called? Hada. Hada. Hada, that means goodbye. Hada, goodbye. Do you see my shirt? Hold on. Do you see my shirt? I love your shirt, man. I love it. You dressed up for the occasion. I did. This, thing, <laughs> this is a silk number that I wear when it's, uh, when it's go time, you know, if you're going out <laughs> to the club or something. <laughs> I, I think it looks great. You know what? Well, well, well I got a chance. Uh, I got to get a shot of that shirt. Yeah. Yeah, let's see that shirt again, Billy. <laughs> you look great, man. You look great. <laughs> Anyway, hey, listen, I've enjoyed talking to you. I know you're probably in quarantine over there, too, but hopefully this, this corona thing ends soon. We can all get back outside. What is the deal with corona in, uh, in Norway? Is there any confirmed uh, cases? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We've had deaths here, but uh, we are on lockdown. Uh, Norway is on a voluntary lockdown. If I go up to the shopping mall, they only allow <coughs> like five people at a time to go into a store, and most of the stores are closed. The pharmacy, the grocery store is open, but uh, they're they're taking it very seriously here, and so we're keeping our our death rates and our illness rates really low. We're doing good, and that's compared to Sweden, which has said, "No, we're going the opposite way. We want everybody to get it, so they build an immunity." And Sweden has deaths just raising through the roof. That was a, wow! I haven't heard about that. that's a mistake. Yeah, because it it really strikes people a lot harder than others. You don't know. It's 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 merciful. Yeah. Sweden is now realizing they went the wrong way. But here in Norway, it's totally different, man. I mean, I go out on the street, and I, I, we don't even have a rush hour anymore. There's nobody out. Nobody, everybody works from home. Uh, but, you know, we're in a social democracy, and the government here takes care of the people when they can't work. And that's, it's a pretty good system, actually. Wow. God, man, eh, look, everything happens for a reason. You ended up in, in Buda, Norway. You know what? If I had not worked with Joe Exotic and I had not had everything burned down, my equipment in his fire and all my personal items in my fire, I wouldn't be sitting here now married to the most incredible. How person. did you get there? What, what got you from broken in Dallas to Buda, Norway and Christina? Well, you know, my wife, Kristen, had, and I had known each other for eight or nine years online. Uh, from after my, my film about my autobiography, TV Junkie, came out in 2006. Yeah. She saw it, liked it, and out of about a half million people that contacted me, she and I continually got closer and closer, and we made a connection in London about five, six, seven years ago. We said, you know, someday, well, when these two fires hit, I got, I, I got nothing to lose. How about I just come over and marry you? And here I am. Wow. It's a love story. It's an amazing one, man. Oh, the ups and downs of life. You've got, you, you, your book is coming next. Yeah, it will be. I've already got it half written, believe me. And uh, the Tiger King stuff that, that was not shown, it's in the book. Incredible. Rick, thank you very much. Billy, great talking to you. Have a great day and stay safe. You too. Much love. All right, buddy. Bye-bye now. Thank you for watching. If you want more extra, hit the subscribe button and the bell so you'll never miss a video.